Genesis 41, 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee! And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was round about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God, said he, hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. Brother Chief, would you ask some blessing in reading God's word, please, sir? Man, thank you. You may be seated. We have looked at the life of Joseph a couple of times recently. I have been re-examining his life, and I want to go there one more time again this morning, trying my best to be in obedience to the Lord and his guidance during the service. I did not know which of the two messages I had I would preach in the morning, which I would preach at night, but I believe this is the way God would have us to go. Do you often feel like you are going through it? I would say so. I can see the smiles and the head shaking and the hands raising. Sometimes it just seems like you're in the dog pile of life. One thing after another thing after another thing. Seems like you cannot catch a break. You are late for work, and it's when you're late for work that the traffic is the worst. And it's when you're late for work and the traffic is the worst that the vehicle decides to break down. And it's when you're late for work and the traffic is the worst the vehicle decides to break down on the week that you're on short time anyway and don't have the money to repair it. Isn't this the way that normally things work? And then there's the health problems of life and the financial problems of life, the family troubles of life. People feel like they're going through it. Well, if anybody ever went through it, Joseph went through it. There is, of course, the description of him and his trials we find here in the book of Genesis. But there's another passage that adds a little bit of detail to that. Keep a marker there where we are, but go to Psalm chapter 105, verse 17. Joseph made his way into a song later on in Israel's history, and it was not, it was not a, a, an upbeat, a pep rally kind of a song. Uh, his part of the song would have doubtless been written in a minor key when you see the details of what Joseph was going through. Psalm 105, look at verse 17 and 18. The Bible says that he, speaking of God, sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. How many of you remember flannel graphs? from when you were a child. The younger set does not know much about flannel grass because they've grown up with smartphones and tablets and CGI and all this. But the flannel graphs we had when we were growing up, you always had Joseph, and Joseph had that pretty multicolored coat. And, and then when the coat got taken away from him and taken off the flannel board, they, they put maybe a, a white or a brown coat on him. It still looked pretty good, and it was still the same Joseph, and he, he still had the same beaming look on his face the entire time. And Oh, he went, into, he went into Potiphar's house. Yeah, but it was so nice there in Potiphar's house, and he went into prison, but I mean, there were still like flower arrangements there in prison. This is, this is sort of like what the flannel graphs always showed us. But the Bible tells us that they laid him in iron fetters. He was literally chained to the ground. His feet were being chafed and blood was coming from his ankles. Joseph was in brutal conditions there in Egypt. 
Now, Joseph, though, comes through that. And in the text that we've just read, there's some interesting verses that you find midway through his life, but before his story is completely over, before the, uh, the brothers are reconciled. Pick it back up in verse 50. Let's read through verse 52 this time. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful, say the next phrase with me, in the land of my what? In the land of my affliction. I want to preach for a few moments on the subject. Being fruitful in the land of affliction. There's a couple things we want to see this morning. Let's look, for first of all, at Joseph's reasons for bitterness. And by this I mean not to say that he was bitter. What I mean to say is he had reasons, humanly speaking, why he could have gotten bitter if he had chosen to. The list is pretty familiar, but let's say we breeze our way through it for anybody that has forgotten or doesn't know. He could have gotten bitter in his life because his dad unwittingly made him a target. When you've got all the older brothers and dad gives you a coat that has, in so many words, embroidered across the back of it, daddy's pet, Daddy has just made you a target for all the other brothers, and they willingly took him up on that. Joseph could have gotten bitter because his brothers, according to Scripture, could not speak peaceably to him. When they got up in the morning, they were saying mean things to him. When they went to lunch, they were saying mean things about him. As they worked through the day, they were saying mean things about him. When they got in from the field at night, they were saying mean things about him. Before they went to bed, they said, Joseph, we hope you have nightmares. It was like this all the time for Joseph. They could not speak peaceably to him. You talk about problems among the children. They had problems among the children, and Joseph could have very easily gotten bitter because of the treatment of his brothers. He could have gotten bitter because his own brothers sold him into slavery. And that is what we call drastic measures for dealing with your brother. I mean, yeah, they don't like him. He's daddy's pet, but really? You're going to sell your own brother into slavery, but it's exactly what they do. They pick him up out of that pit, sell him to the Ishmaelites and Midianites. He could have very easily gotten bitter. The Bible indicates that he is down there in the pit crying for mercy. They're on the side of the pit eating their lunch. He is begging them to be kind to him and to remember that he is their flesh and blood. They couldn't care less. They see an opportunity to get some money in their pocket, so they pick him up out of the pit. They sell him into slavery. That could make a person bitter. He could have gotten bitter because of the culture shock of being yanked out of one country and put into a completely different country. Though they were not too very far apart, I'm telling you the culture between where they were and Egypt was a drastic difference, and he is taken away from all things that are familiar to him. He could have gotten very bitter because of Mrs. Potiphar. Things are finally starting to go okay for Joseph, if things can be okay in slavery. He is being elevated in the house of Potiphar. Mrs. Potiphar chooses to try to strike up an illicit relationship with him. When he refuses, she lies about him, accuses him of attempted rape. He has now got his good name ruined. It is in tatters, and he is not just a slave in Egypt. Now he's thrown into prison. Don't you think that could possibly make somebody just a wee bit bitter? He could have gotten bitter because of the prison itself. Day by day, think on this one, he is locked up away from the outside world while his brothers are out there free. He's locked up in this prison while Miss Potiphar is out there free. Everybody that has done wrong is getting by, and he's done right, and he's in prison. Don't you think that worked on him just a little bit? Could have very easily been bitter. He could have been bitter because of the physical pain of the fetters and who knows what else. We don't know how many times he was beaten for his supposed crime. Don't know what all he went through, but we know that prison is not a good experience no matter where and no matter when. He could have easily gotten bitter. He could have gotten bitter about being forgotten by the butler. 
You remember the account I told you just a couple of weeks ago. There are a couple of guys there in prison. They are upset. They're, they're sad. Joseph has now been elevated over the prison. He comes in and asks them why they are sad. They, they have had some dreams they can't figure out the meaning of. Joseph tells the butler, well, your dream means you're going to stand before Pharaoh again three days from now. He tells the baker, your dream means your head's going to be cut off three days from now. So he says to the butler, when you go see Pharaoh, remember me to Pharaoh. I've done nothing to be here in Egypt. I've done nothing to be in this prison. I'm an innocent man. Please speak to me. Speak to Pharaoh for me. And the guy gets out and forgets to speak about Joseph. Now, you know good and well that was not an accidental forgetting. That is an I don't want to rock the boat with Pharaoh anymore forgetting. So he has been abandoned by this guy that he helped. That kind of thing can make you very, very bitter. He could have gotten bitter because of all the thoughts bouncing around in his mind all these years. Do you realize that most of the battles you face are going to be battles in your head? All, all the time that you have a little bit of time on your hand, when you're driving, you know what you're doing? You're probably thinking. When you're laying there in bed, you know what you're doing? You're, you're probably thinking, and you know the devil is whipping up the thoughts in his mind, whipping up the memories in the mind of everything he's been through. He could have very easily gotten bitter. He could have gotten bitter against God because the promises of God didn't seem to be coming true, and the dreams seemed to be getting further and further away. You do remember the promises, don't you? Joseph, as a 17-year-old boy, has made some pretty concrete promises by God. Uh, God gives him these dreams, not just once but twice, and the dreams in so many words say, your brothers are going to bow down to you. You will be royalty, Joseph. And Joseph, he just has, just has enough sense to believe God. He just has enough sense to believe that God said it, therefore it's going to happen. But, but now, Brother Ford, now his brothers are not only not bound before him, they're free, and he's in prison. They're back in their land. He's in a foreign land. Everything seems to be going, are you ready for this? The exact opposite way of the way God said it would go. There is nothing that can breed bitterness in you any quicker than the seeming situation of believing that God has made you a promise and seeing it go the exact opposite way, not just for a little while, but for year after year after year after year. Joseph, we can say, had ample reasons to be bitter. Now, again, please don't misunderstand me. Scripturally, there's no good reason to be bitter. But if we're speaking of it in human terms and human thought process, rationality would say Joseph's got a lot of reasons for bitterness. So we see Joseph's reasons for bitterness. But notice number two, Joseph's response instead of bitterness. Pick it back up in verse 41, or chapter 41, verse 50 through 52 again. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now please tell me, what word did those verses end with? What was the word? Affliction. Let me ask this. Did Joseph sugarcoat the fact that he'd been in affliction? No, no he didn't. Was Joseph willing to acknowledge the fact that things had been pretty hard? Was he open and honest about the fact that he had really gone through it for a very long time? Yes, he was. He said, God's caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Should Joseph did not sugarcoat his experience, he admitted that things had been bad, but he lived such a life during that affliction that God could richly bless during that affliction. It is during his affliction that he refuses to give in to Mrs. Potiphar's seduction. It is during that affliction that he is faithful in Potiphar's house. It is during that affliction that he is faithful in the prison. It is during that affliction that he is willing to reach out and be a blessing and a help to others. It is during that affliction he is willing to stand before Pharaoh, the man in charge of the land in which he is now a captive, and try to be a help not just to him but to the entire rest of the world, one of the keys to overcoming your potential bitterness is to always do right all the way through it. 
So no matter what Joseph is going through in these afflictions, he lived such a life during that affliction that God could richly bless that affliction. And boy, did God bless. And when God blessed, Joseph for, chose to forget the toil and to remember the treasure. Joseph stands before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, this is a great plan you've got. I'm going to put you in charge of it, but not only are you in charge of the plan, you are going to sit on a throne. You will be second in command of Egypt and therefore second in command of the entire world. I'm putting a crown on your head, a garment on your back, a ring on your finger. You will ride in the royal chariot. Everyone will bow the knee before you. Joseph, I'm going to make you somebody special. But Joseph, it wouldn't really do to have a single guy having all that. That, that kind of blessing needs to be shared. Amen, ladies? So he says... I'm going to give you a wife. And he gives Joseph a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. He marries this girl, and they apparently get along very well because children start coming along. He has a child named Manasseh. He has a child named Ephraim. He is royalty. He is comfortable. He is not hurt in fetters and irons anymore. He has everything that he wants. Look at the list of what he's, what he's got. His dream is now back on track. I wonder if it ever occurred to Joseph, you know, how did I think my brothers were going to bow to me there in the land where we were? Under what circumstances and in what place in the land where I was were they ever going to bow to me? But all of a sudden, I'm second in the command of Egypt. In other words, I don't, I don't know the details yet. But now the dream is back on track. If there's ever going to be a scenario in which my brothers will bow, this is a potential scenario in which my brothers will bow. The dream is back on track. Joseph looked around. He says, you know what else I've got? My name is cleared now. Mrs. Potiphar had all kinds of untrue things to say about me. Now everybody knows that's not the case. I, Pharaoh trusts me. I'm second in command to him. I, I'm now at peace. I'm not in turmoil anymore. I, I've got a wife. I, I, I have a son. Now I have another son. And Joseph looked around at the totality of what God made out of his life, and he said, first of all, God has made me to forget all my toil. In other words, Brother Robbins, he's saying, what I've got now is so very good that I'm even having trouble remembering how bad I had it. I can't believe it's gotten this good. Then he has another son, and he names him a name that means God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. He's saying not only are the afflictions done, not only is the toil passed, but God has so richly blessed me that I would not have it any other way under any circumstances. I want you to pay attention to this. Joseph ended up with things not in spite of his affliction. Now get this. We always think that God is able to bless us in spite of our afflictions. Now, is God able to bless us in spite of our afflictions? Of course he is. But can I just put it this way? That'd be sort of boring and mundane. I mean, being blessed in spite of our afflictions, that's for God. That's sort of a small thing, don't you think? A little bit boring and mundane. God's bigger than that. God did not bless Joseph in spite of his afflictions. Listen to me. God blessed Joseph because of and directly through his afflictions. I want you to think on this and follow it. Joseph has gone through all of this, and it is because of what he goes through he gets all this. If he had not gone through that, he's not on the throne and his brothers are never going to bow to him. If he's not gone through this, he may have gotten a wife, but can we just observe the fact that people that are royalty are normally given wives that are just a touch above average? I don't know what kind of person he would have married back there in the land of Egypt, but as Pharaoh's second in command, I can promise you, he's not given some scrubby little wife. He's given the best of the best that Egypt has to offer. If Joseph has not got his afflictions, he may have had kids, but not those. My children sometimes get philosophical, and they ask questions. Dad, if you and Mom had met each other, if y'all had married other people, what would that meant for us? I said, you better ask Dr. Who, honey. <laughs> what that really would have meant was there wouldn't be a them, literally. Dana may have had kids by whatever 
you know, schlub she married that you know got lucky and married up. But I, I, I may have had kids, but it wouldn't have been those. Wouldn't have been those. Joseph had Manasseh because he went through this affliction. Now, brother, I'm going to tell you something. When you're holding that brand new baby, that baby is like, I mean, an angel from heaven. A stinky, smelly, red, wrinkled angel from heaven. But you love them. And you would not trade that baby for anything in the universe or any other child in the universe. Joseph's got a child that he loves now more than life itself. And he has that child not in spite of his afflictions, but because of his afflictions. Joseph has another child later on, not in spite of his afflictions, because of his afflictions. Every time he sees them, he knows, I would not have had these boys had I not gone through what I went through. Listen, these blessings came to him as a direct result of his affliction. You and I right now, child of God, are living in the only land of affliction we will ever know. Where we're going, there is no affliction. Where we're going, there are no graves. Where we're going, there are no doctors. Where we're going, there are no lawyers. Where we're going, there are no politics. Where, where we're going, there is no persecution. Where we're going, there, there are no aspirins and crutches and glasses and wheelchairs and IVs. Where we're going, there's no heartache. There's no misunderstanding. There's no disappointments. There's no goodbyes. Where we're going, there's no affliction. This is the only land of affliction we'll ever know. But it is a land of affliction. It is a land of affliction. We do go through it here. We do wonder here what in the world God could possibly have in mind. Can I tell you what God's got in mind? God doesn't have in mind blessing you in spite of your afflictions as much as he has in mind blessing you because of your afflictions. Joseph looks at everything he's gone through and he, igno he knows I've been through it and I didn't deserve it. I've done right. Joseph could legitimately say, I've done right the entire way. And Joseph looks around and goes, and I've paid the price for it. You do right the entire way, there'll be a price to pay. And you will sometimes feel so afflicted that you wonder if it's even worth it. How often do you wonder, do you think, Joseph wondered if it was worth it? How many days there in the prison do you think he wondered, Lord, is this even worth it? God, I'm going through all this. My dreams are getting further from ever. God, is it worth it? But I got news for you. When she started walking down the aisle, Joseph was going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's worth it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah it's worth it. When, when, when she came to him later and said, baby, we're in a family way. Oh, yeah, it's worth it. When he, when he held that first boy, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it was worth it. When she came to him later, honey, we're about to have another one. Oh, oh yeah, it's worth it. When, she, when he held that second boy, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's worth it. When he's sitting on the throne, oh, yeah, it's worth it. I'm telling you, God will bless you because of your affliction. If you're a child of God and you do right, it's not just that God can bless you and help you to get through that. It's that God can and will bless you to such a degree that you say, God's made me to forget everything I've ever been through. God has blessed me in the land of my affliction. Child of God, don't you ever give up hope, not for a day. Don't you ever for a single moment think God has forgotten you or laid his plans and promises aside. I'm telling you, he's taking you through what he takes you through, not so that he can bless you in spite of it, but that he can bless you directly through it.